I am uh, Major Mangum. I'm the Chief of Strength Management Division. It's one of my responsibilities that uh, isn't... Yes, sir. One of my responsibilities is to review the personnel section of everybody's USR for the whole command. So that's about 103 USRs because some of the brigades get to do an extra USR, so I have to look at those as well. And 807th HHC actually has three USRs, so Captain Warburton, our HHC commander, gets to do three USRs. Every, well, not every month necessarily, but at least once a quarter. Next slide. So here's the, here's the agenda. Basically, this presentation is not a how-to course on, on doing the USR from beginning to end, but more it's, I hope, to make it a, to highlight some areas that, that will help, first and foremost, make a better, better unit status report that will pr be more accurate, and secondly, that it will, that I'd like to share some ideas that will help decrease the likelihood of you start kicking those USRs back. And, and the commands don't usually see those USRs that kick back, but between myself or Mr. Allen or somebody at 807th, those USRs have to be reviewed and fixed before USARC will accept them. And this is all done in a tight window and then they have to go up to HQDA. And thirdly, I'm trying to make it a little less painful for all of us. I can't make it so you can't, don't have to do the USR, can't, can't take that away, but uh, maybe some of the things we talk about will help. For those of you who don't have to touch USRs, be thankful, but you know, sometimes those things those might be in your responsibilities in the future, so maybe uh, pay attention or, or uh, take some notes. There is not a test. <laughs> next slide. Ah, we're already on the next slide. So here's some light reading. Uh, this is a little bit longer than the, the policies and things that Sergeant Larson has, but I only listed three references, although there are some other things. So the, the website actually for NetUSR, this is the uh, nipper, so you don't have to be on your secure to go to this website. There's some tools and things that are available to help help with the USR. Commander's report. We know it's a commander's report. Now, how many of us in here are commanders? There's a few commanders. Kent Warburton and a couple others. So, unless we're a commander, we're the delegate or we're part of a team that works with the delegate to submit that USR. Um, now I know, you know, those commanders that actually do there, there's some TPU commanders that are, that are involved and I appreciate those TPU commanders and I can actually tell sometimes when I'm reading the USRs that it's the commander that's, that's actually put in the, in the remarks because it's a little bit more personal than if it's a staff officer. That being said, not all commanders have the time or, or the, the knowledge and understanding to do the USR all by themselves. So when we're preparing and reviewing the USRs, it's important that we get them done on time while maintaining accuracy and uh, try not to ex exaggerate or to kind of hide the truth. Sometimes, sometimes it's easy based on how we, how we how do the USR to forget about that. We want higher headquarters to see what the unit is at, really is. And yes, contrary to popular belief, those USRs are reviewed at levels above the brigade and the 807th. Now they may put less emphasis on some than others, but especially if your unit's getting ready to go out the door, it's getting reviewed and it's getting reviewed, um, scrutinized, and they want to see they want to see things that that uh, that are honest, truthful, accurate, and uh, and paint the picture. Next slide. All right, this is kind of a busy slide. I cut and pasted this from another slide. I didn't create it. Um, don't have the time to create it, but somebody else already did it. Basically, when we compute the P-level for a unit status report, there's three, there's three areas that go into that. Uh, there's the available strength, which is basically taken who you have assigned divided by the requirements. Then you say, well, okay, who, then the next one is the assigned MOS skills match, which is taking those that are assigned, and if they're MOS qualified for the position that they're in on the USR, you divide that by the requirements for those positions. And the third area is the, the available senior grade. And this is actually a, com a combination, a compilation of the senior grade percentages at several different levels. So they actually measure E5 and E6, they measure E7 to E9, they measure it for the warrants, and they measure it from uh, second lieutenant to captain, and from major to lieutenant colonel. And then there's a calculation that's take, taking place in net USR that you don't see, but it, it does the work for you, and be thankful that it does that for you. So how, how, how do we uh, 
uh, improve on that? Well, it does all the math for us, so let's do the other part. Let's properly code and properly slot our soldiers. So next slide. UMR maintenance. So a lot of you think of UMR, you're thinking of your unit manning report. Uh, the unit manning report is, is, uh, that I'm talking about here is actually for net USR. So we're not talking about updating our last unit manning report, although that does impact the USR. So what I'm talking about, and when you go into net USR, there's a requirement. USARC says slot everyone that's assigned to your unit. Well, many of you say, well, I can't do that. Well, there are exceptions. So the system doesn't allow you to slot a second lieutenant or a warrant officer one into a position that's two grades above. So you can't slot them. What do you do? You actually click a little check mark that's in there, code them as IERR, and you put in a remark. Now this is important. If you don't slot a soldier, so I see when I review the USR, and there will be a screenshot, we'll talk a little bit about this. When I see the USR review it, and there's soldiers that are unslotted, first thing I'm going to look for is that remark. I'm going to hope the unit told me why. If they're a second lieutenant and a warrant, I know the reason just by looking at it. Unless that unit actually has a first lieutenant position or W-2 position that they can be slotted in, and many units do not, I should see a remark in the, in the overall peer remark that says, for example, two soldiers not slotted because they're second lieutenants and net USR does not allow me to slot second lieutenants into a captain position. Something to that effect. Now there's other exceptions. You say, well, the soldier's no longer here in my unit. That's great. So if you choose to not slot them, you need to have documentation. That is an approved transfer, loss, separation, retirement, an order that moves them out of your unit, whatever version of that order is, but an approved order, not a transfer request that's been sent up through HR Pass, but an actual order. And then you can code them the same way, IERR, there's a little box that you check, and then in that same remark, in your overall P remark, you could say, going back to the first example, I got two soldiers that I cannot slot. One's a second lieutenant, that USR doesn't allow me, the other one has approved separation orders, and that's it. If you do not put a remark in there, I'm not gonna know what that other soldier, why they were not slotted, so I'm going to actually slot that soldier. So if, they're, if I know they're separated, and yeah, occasionally I know of AGRs, because I deal with AGR actions, that they've PCS to a new unit. I may be able to know that, but for nine, nine out of ten, I don't know. Now, the second lieutenant, yes, I'll make the remark. I can't slot them. The system won't let me, so I'm going to have to write that remark in for you, and I'm going to put it on my little smiley face or not smiley face checklist for that unit, and then they're not, that's, those aren't going necessarily out to the unit directly, but they're going out sometimes to the brigades in, in a form of an AAR, where I don't try not to identify the specific units, but I do check for trends to see if the same units over a period of time are continuing to do the same thing. Second part of this is skills match. This is actually, I would say, the, the most time consuming part, except for review and remarks, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, of the USR, is I've, I will, especially on those caches that are nearly 500 man units, and a lot of them have more than 500 people, I will sort the screen by AOC, and I'll go down and I'll say, oh, Here's all the immaterial positions. I got 05 alphas. For 807th, I got 01 alphas. I've got as the rest of them on the list right there. And I'm going to say, you got people assigned. Why are they not a skills match? And the reason is, net USR is really smart. It's going to say, if somebody's a 70 hotel and you put them in a 70 hotel position, it's automatically going to mark them as a skills match. If they're a 92 Yankee and they're in a 92 Yankee position, it automatically is a skills match. If they don't have in their primary, secondary, or tertiary AOC or MOS, that AOC or MOS that matches the duty position you slot them for, then it's not going to make them a skills match. You have to manually go and do that. So we got to be careful with this. There are rules. So I gave you some basic rules right there on the, on the PowerPoint slide. But if you want to go to regulation, anyone know the regulation where you might find substitutability rules? Just shout it out. OK. So there's a PROFIS re regulation out there. It's and it's, it's on, on another slide. Well, I might not have listed on the slide, but I was going to discuss it. It's AR 601-142. There's table one in there. This is a substitutability regulation. It is commonly used for USR purposes. And on there, it'll say, for the first example, 
well, it might not say for the L5 Alpha, but for the 66 November, if you go on that table, it's going to say all nurse corps officers for the 63 Romeo, all dental corps officers. Basically what that is telling you is if you have a nurse in a 66 November and there's three of those positions at a combat support hospital, that they are automatically a skills match. It's immaterial. So please go through and check those. Now, you shouldn't have to do this every time. Once that nurse has been checked one month and three months later, that nurse hasn't been moved to another position, that check should still be there. But you need to check those because I have found there has been a, one USR and several USRs that the percentages have changed, but one USR where I actually changed the overall P level by going through and checking those skills matches. But even if it doesn't change your P level when I do it, it does increase the percentages, and that's what USARC sees. The higher the percentages, and they do roll up percentages and say, okay, I got 16 caches in the Army Reserve, what's our average personnel readiness? Those percentages are important, especially if they're going to decide to, to restructure units and commands. So here's some other examples on that list there. Uh, one, one that sometimes is missed is the 67 Deltas. You know, that's a behavioral health, a 73 Alpha and a 73 Bravo are most qualified on that. Uh, next slide, oh, we're on the screenshot, okay. On here, so here's the, here's the screenshot. And if you look kind of down there in the bottom right, you see little check marks right there underneath the, the skills match column where the circle is. That's where you're gonna go and check that. So we have to be very careful. You can actually check, check this for, for, for anyone, NCO officer on there. However, you don't want to check it if you don't have proper documentation or it doesn't meet the substitutability criteria. So there is one, there is one AMED, or not AMED, there is one immaterial enlisted position, and that's a 00 golf, but I think only 807th HHC has that on there. However, you might have a soldier that you have a, a DD-214, MOS order, something, and TAP DBR hasn't caught up. So if they haven't caught up and you have a documentation that they now have that MOS or that AOC, then it would be appropriate. Now for AMED officers, you're going to ask yourself, I got somebody that's really a great operations officer and they're assigned to my 70 hotel position, but they're a nurse corps officer. What are you going to, what are you going to mark? They're not a skills match, but they may be able to do that operations officer job even better than some 70 hotels. But guess what? They're not a, they're not a, they're not a skills match. Well, what about a 70 Bravo, which is just a medical service corps, you know, platoon, platoon leader, position, medical serv services officer. Well, they haven't got the 70 hotel. They haven't gone to the course. They're not a skills match. And I'd like to, if anyone has some concerns with that, we can, we can discuss it at the end or hit me up offline. We already talked about uh, 601 dash, dash 142. On there, there's also some other substitutable AOCs. So if I am a internist, 61 Foxtrot, and I'm slotted against 61 Foxtrot, that's great. But guess what? What if you got extra 61 Fs? But there's a vacant 61 hotel, family physician. That table is going to tell you that you can put somebody that might be a little bit more qualified than a family physician into that family physician job. So pay attention on that. There's a few of those where you can be a little creative and improving your USR. And you're not, you're not making stuff up. You got s um, supporting documentation. If you're not sure about substitutability, I will take that call every day of the week. So please feel free to give me a call or an email. Properly coding. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, the medical availability codes, that's, that's pulled in through the, uh, when the, the data um, extract file is uploaded, that comes from MedPros. But if you know that so-and-so now is not medically available, but they were, because they, they, they just got back their permanent profile, and for some reason it was never put in before the data extract on the first of the month, you can go and you can manually change that. Um, you can change it also if it's improved. Now that might be cumbersome or, or a lot to do for a cache, so, so you kind of have to you know, take that with a grain of salt and do what you can. Smaller units, one person can make the difference between a P4 and a P3, P3, P2, P, P2, P1. So if you know somebody's either available or has become unavailable, again, going back to the accuracy, and you have the supporting documentation, that can be updated. Same thing with the administratively available. We know a lot of our officers out there haven't gone to Bullock. How many of them are actually coded 
as a B2 in RLAS. If they're not coded as B2, they're not going to come up in here as an administratively unavailable. They're going to come up as, as available. So you can go in here and you click on that admin little check mark, which will be on the next screen when we look at the screenshot, and code them as TN. They haven't completed enough training to be deployed. We don't want to send somebody downrange, put them on any kind of orders, and they haven't gone to OBC. And yes, this has happened. We've had people in Iraq and Afghanistan that have not completed OBC. AMED, docs, dentists, nurses, yes. Not necessarily reserves, I can't come, but I know a lot of AC that have done that. And believe me, it gets level, it gets, we have people at the Pentagon saying, how did this happen? And then everyone's jumping through hoops, TSG, everyone. Next slide. All right, so proper coding. Now this, this shows you where you can check all those. So I, on, the, on the slide before, I also had AGRs marked on there. If you know your soldier's AGR, check the box. If they're pregnant, make sure that's changed in there as well. Some of those things happen, and you can't get it updated in the system in time. Little things like that. Um, this is where you're also, as I mentioned earlier, if you can code somebody as IEIR, this is where you're going to find them. You're going to put the little check mark on there, and it's going to move them up to the top. It's going to unslot them. So if you have a separation order, that's where you're going to deal with that. Next slide. All right. So when we do our remarks, and remarks is a big thing, um, I spend most of my time doing the remarks, if I'm going to actually count how much time I spent. And that is because I like to make sure that when something goes up, that it's, I don't make sure it's completely accurate. I can't check every little thing on there, but it somewhat makes sense. Because this is, the remarks are read. They're rolled up. They're read at higher levels. So we want to be precise. We want to be concise. We don't need to write a book. It also means we don't want to write just one sentence unless that's all that needs to be said. And they should be able to stand alone. They don't need to go somewhere else to understand the piece that you put in there. No duplication. So this is the part that really gets me. And I know there's conflicting um, instructions out there. So if you have your overall peer remark and it spells out everything about your personnel, why you're, you don't have enough assigned or enough available and, and spells out by MOS and AOC and everything's perfectly great in there, do not take that same remark and copy and paste it and put it in another remark cell, as, as I'll show you on the next screen. If you do that, and I see it, I'm just deleting it. So you're spending time putting it in there and I'm spending time taking it out. So exact copies are not good. Very similar copies are not good. The reasons for the other remark cells are for you to be more definitive in those specific areas of the USR. Next slide. So there's 12 opportunities for the commander to, to put something in there about personnel in the personnel area. There's also other opportunities in the overall. So I, if, you're, if you're a P1, you don't need any remarks. And that's good, but if you want to put a mark in there about on the P1 and say, you know, I might be going to a P2 because I'm seeing this and this and then this, that's great for the commander to do that. But it isn't required, but they want to be as, as um, precise as they can on that. However, I don't need 11 other remarks. So I'm going to expect a remark in every, an overall P remark for every USR that's not a 1. I don't need a remark in every other field unless you have something to say specific to that field. Now, I said don't put duplicative remarks. I also don't like to see a remark that is, how shall we say, um, obvious. So if you have two AGRs, don't put in a remark, I have two AGRs assigned. If you have two AGRs and four authorizations, say, I have two AGRs out of four authorizations. We're 50% staffing. This impacts mission readiness, da 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 da. Or I have all four, but I'm losing two in the next month and don't have any projected backfills. And I know that situation applies to a lot of units. I don't see that many. A few of the remarks are out there, and that's great. Make the remark pertinent or don't put it in there. Again, pregnant soldiers. If you say I got four pregnant soldiers, that's great. Doesn't tell me anything about when they're coming back, when they're going to impact your overall personnel. So. Say, I got four pregnant soldiers, two of them will be, be available fourth quarter, and two of them will be available first quarter of FY16. Perfect <laughs> remark. After that, you know, you got, you got a few other remarks on there about 
about uh, your, your MOS available, your senior grade. If you've already addressed those in your overall remark and they're specific enough, you don't need to spell them out more. But you can, and I'm okay with that. If there's a remark in every one of these and there's, they're pertinent to that and it hasn't been said elsewhere, please, please put them in there. Last thing on this slide is do not use all caps. Many of you that have done USRs for more than the last six, eight years probably know when there was a time we were using a different system and it was all in capitals. No longer. So you're going to write it just like you're going to do a normal email or a memo. Yes. Nice sentences are good. Sometimes bullets, sometimes abbreviations. Oh yes, and if you have an abbreviation and you're pretty sure it's not a standard that everyone knows what that abbreviation is, spill it out. I've found a couple of those on there. And then as you do your remarks, reread them. Because I type with three or four fingers and my thes are HTEs and other things they get they get my letters get swapped. So start a sentence with a capital, end with a period, and reread it because I do fix on average about fifteen percent of the the remarks have something in there, not just a period missing, but something that just on a cursory review is wrong. All right, I think we're to the last slide except for the question slide. So AAR, so USARC actually calls, has a conference call every month. Mr. Allen at, at, at uh, 807th has me on that conference call. We sit in there and we listen to USARC talk about, generally speaking, the issues on the, on the uh, USRs for the previous month, some trends and things like that. So I've listed some of those that, that they have brought up. These aren't me, but I've already talked about all of them. Uh, really the immaterial slots, which we talked about, not skills matched. So if, if we get those skills matched, then, then we're not going to be one of those targeted. And they actually have specified a couple units within the 807th in the past by unit number and said, hey, what's going on with the skills match? Or on the second bullet, hey, we had some soldiers that were improperly slotted, and if you slot them somewhere else, then it's going to increase their personnel numbers. The IAR soldiers, yes, everyone continues to leave people unslotted but won't put a remark in there. I don't need a remark in all 12 of those spots, just need it once in the overall. And make sure your remarks don't, or yeah, they say the remarks don't match reality, so make sure your mar the remarks match reality. If the unit's broken, make sure that you're saying it's broken. If it's great but it's going to be broken, well, make sure that that's, that's annotated as well and spell out as, you're do, as the remarks are done, not just what the current situation is, what the commander's proposed fix is and how it's impacting the, the readiness of the unit. If we do all of these things, it's going to make your life a little easier, my life a little easier. And if you have any questions on USR, you know, six years ago I did USRs every month it seemed like. And so it's been six years since I've touched USRs until I came back this past, and about September, I started having to review all the, the USRs. So I'm relearning a little bit, but when I sit and look at 103 every quarter and 20 to 30 on the months in between, it's starting to come back to me. So I haven't got to the point yet of calling individual units, except for once or twice, and saying, hey, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. I'm just fixing them and writing down notes not kicking them back. Mr. Allen is the one that would kick them back based on my thing and then most of your threes would be the ones hitting you up on those. So, pending any questions, this concludes